Okay, so hello everybody. Um, I'm Catherine Deeming and I'm doing PhD at the University of Strathclyde uh, with Zoe and Jen Roberts and Jen Dickey who's at Stirling. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, a part of my PhD project which has been funded by Scottish Enterprise and the, the topic is um, unlocking the economic potential of mine water geothermal in Scotland. So just a bit of an introduction um, to the project. So Scottish Enterprise wanted to look at um, how we could identify different opportunities and challenges of developing workforce capacity um, so that we could develop more mine water geothermal schemes in Scotland and also determine the awareness of these different, um, of this technology among different professionals who may be outside of uh, geologists and people in universities and this people in, in this kind of area. Um, so for the project, we just limited the stakeholders to uh, commercial and industrial stakeholders and didn't speak to any community groups, landlords or householders. Um, so this is kind of part, um, it's kind of, yeah, part of my main, my wider PhD, but my, yeah, my wider PhD is looking at integrating um, spatial data about mine water, um, such as we saw from David earlier with his um, atlas for Scotland, like the kind of technical and geological data. I want to integrate that with things like heat demand and other social factors such as like deprivation um, and environmental factors to kind of try and address some of the energy trilemma or quadrilemma, however you want to look at it. Um, so the quadrilemma idea is that there's a social aspect uh, to this which is kind of separate like kind of neglected from the trilemma but yeah so that would include uh, fuel poverty and things but I'm going to look into that a bit more um so just a bit of context um and I'm not going to go into loads because obviously we all know what different things mine water thermal resource could be used for um but I've just got a few examples here so this is using it uh, a mine to heat an individual building um, it could also be used as a source for a district heating network, um, as shown by this nice picture, seeing all the little uh, pipes going through. Or it could be used, as we've seen, as a, um, a thermal energy store for a fifth generation district heating and cooling uh, network. So some more context about the project. Um, part of the idea with, th with this is why would industry stakeholders need to know about mine water and the main um, point is that they need to know about it in order to consider it in the early stages of planning a development such as this one um, because the kind of uh, once they've made their plans and they've paid their architects and whoever to design things it's a lot of cost to go back and change it um, so they need to know about all the different options in order to consider it at the start and um, so we kind of thought about I'll move on to this later but we thought about who might be involved in those decisions um, some more context is that in Scotland, they're going to ban any gas fired boilers from new build houses in 2024. So housing developers and similar uh, companies will need to think of new ways to heat their new build homes. Um, so while I was doing this project, Red Row, which is a large house builder in the UK, um, they announced that they're going to be the first to have heat air source heat pumps specifically as their heating solution as a standard. Um, so I decided for this, I decided to look into whether air source heat pumps would be um, a good, efficient way of heating some homes. Um, and I found that there's certain climatic conditions which are not um, very suitable or less suitable for air source heat pumps due to the frost being formed on like the, the fans of the air source heat pumps. Um, so I found this, they'd done this research in Italy, this paper where they um, installed heat pumps in lots of different places in Italy which had different climates and they found that where the temperature in winter was between zero and six degrees um, and the relative humidity was over 80%, they found that this caused a lot of frost to be formed on the, uh, on the fans and that reduced the efficiency, the COP um, of the air source heat pumps by 17% um, because they were using electricity to defrost themselves rather than heating the homes. So I just thought I'd have a look at Scotland and see what was the, the climate there. So these are from the Met Office, both of these figures, and here I've shown the range between zero and six degrees. And you can see that 
Um, this is showing the blue line is the minimum temperature, average minimum temperature. And you can see the average minimum um, is in that range for six months of the year in Paisley. Um, and you can see on this map here that the relative humidity of the sort of central belt of Scotland is between 84 and 86 percent. So that falls within those climatic conditions for reduced efficiency of the air source heat pumps. Um, so therefore, I think that's kind of, you know, we should, house builders should definitely look into using other um, types of heat, heat pumps, such as ground source or mine water source or water source, because the temperatures involved are more constant, so they're more efficient. Um, so this, I'm just going to move on to my project, what I've actually done. So this is just a little diagram showing uh, my project so far and what I've done. So yeah, I started off with a stakeholder mapping exercise to try and find some people to interview. Then we, um, with the help of my supervisors, recruited some uh, people to interview and I did semi-structured interviews um, in January and February. Um, and then I transcribed all the interviews and I'm presenting today just the initial analysis from that data. And then going moving forward, I'm going to do a more in detailed and in-depth um, thematic analysis to kind of try and get some more insights and then we'll do a discussion and recommendations. So um, this is just the kind of overview of the stakeholder mapping that I did. Um, so I kind of, my main thought was who who is involved in creating like a new build estate or, you know, commercial development, like who needs to be involved and who needs to know about it. Um, so main obvious one, house builders and property developers. Um, engineering consultants or other just general consultancies will need to be involved in uh, making like the uh, EIA if they need one and doing like ground investigations and things in an early stage so they need to know about it before plan permission is done. Um, supply chain companies would need to know about mine water because they might need to provide heat pumps for the projects. Uh, landowners, if they need to know because if they've got if they know they've got mines on their land, it could be of use to them. Um, local authorities, kind of similar to the landowners, they might have these resources on their land, which could be of use. And utility companies, I think they would need to know because they obviously have a lot of assets already in the ground, such as gas or water pipes. And if some another company is going to come and want to add in district heating pipes, they'd need to be aware of it. Um, so the colours will become clear here. So these are... Um, the people that I interviewed, obviously I've taken away the names um, so that it's anonymous, um, but the colours show the different um, groups that they're in. And yellow is um, people who I, they kind of didn't really fit into one of these categories, but they were still useful to interview. Um, so yeah, I've got that here. Um, this one, they kind of, the company owned land, but they also developed the land and property that they owned. So they've got two. Um, but yeah, I think I got quite a good mixture of the different stakeholders, which um, was pretty good. Sadly, we couldn't get any local authorities for this stage, um, just because I think they're all super busy at the moment, which is understandable. Um, but hopefully maybe in the future could uh, get a local authority perspective. Um, okay, so this is the kind of initial very coarse broad overview of some of the results that I got from these interviews. Um, like I said, I'm still an, like analysing the, the data. Um, yeah, so the first one of this little initial bit was, um, what, uh, the question I asked was, what methods of decarbonisation of heat are you aware of? So this is to try and get a picture about what the people I was interviewing already knew about, aside from mine water. Um, so this shows the different answers. So this is a proportion of the total answers that were given. And um, some people said five or six different methods. Some people only said one or two. And um, so I've just kind of put them all together and heat pumps were the most mentioned um, out of all the methods. And I've broken that down here to show the different types. Some people just said heat pumps generally, and then some people specified, but everybody who mentioned air source heat pumps also mentioned ground source. They were kind of mentioned as a pair. Um, which was interesting and then some people said like heat from the Clyde or heat from sewage without saying heat pumps but I kind of included that in this because um, that's how it would be working um, and then yeah dis district heating got quite a lot of mentions 
and then we've got retrofitting here, which is kind of slightly a slightly different method of you know energy efficiency and things was being mentioned to kind of it would need to go alongside all these things, but a lot of quite a few people mentioned that, and then hydrogen was mentioned um, quite a lot, and but it was only kind of at the as a sort of oh yeah, and there's hydrogen as well. Um, it wasn't kind of people were unsure about it, but I thought I should point that out because it's got quite a large slice of the pie there. Um, okay, the next question. Um, this is still in the kind of section about general decarbonisation. I had three sections in the interview. So the first bit was about the person and what their company did and what they did. And the second section was about decarbonisation of heat. And then later talked about mine water because I wanted to get this like full picture of what they were aware of. Um, so this was about their kind of main concerns of decarbonisation of heat and a lot of them answered this at length um, but I've just tried to pick out the kind of main key ones that they said was their like main concern so there's quite a wide range of concerns and I think that shows that it's quite a varied and complicated um, landscape um, for this technology um, so main one I think quite a key one I think as well as the cost of electricity for these projects and the way that electricity is priced um, to be bought off the grid. Um, they thought that that, some people thought that was going to be a real issue because of its high cost. Um, who's going to pay for these projects was a main concern. Um, the electricity grid um, needing upgrading to be able to take all these new heat pumps and installations coming online. Um, high capital costs, including like, you know, drilling costs if it was mine water. Um, skills and labour shortage, um, particularly to do with like the maintenance of heat pumps. Um, I think there's quite a few companies that do installation and then maintenance doesn't seem to have as many people. Um, quite a few people said a sort of lack of joined up thinking among the whole area. They kind of lots separate companies come in and do their separate things and they're not uh, joining up. Um, this one is a quote, a direct quote from someone that everybody's talking about it. Um, nobody's doing doing it um, and I think that's just in reference to general decarbonisation um, but I think that's quite a, an interesting quote um, and then a couple of people said they had no concerns about the decarbonisation of heat itself but were mainly concerned around the different governance of it and a couple said that there was a lot of bureaucracy around it and um, so I think that I'm gonna I want to really delve more into this um, in my main analysis I want to do the kind of barriers and enablers of this technology um, and then in the mine water section I kind of moved on to ask them whether they're aware of this concept which is a kind of key part of this uh, research um, so nine out of the 11 people that I interviewed said that they were um, this is obviously not going to be representative of like the general public and um, because these people were chosen because they are in a position that they might know about it so yeah and I kind of also looked into why they knew about it or how they'd heard about it and I'd say around maybe three or four of them they had heard of it because their educational background as a geologist or a geotechnical engineer um, and then some people were working on similar projects such as like heat from rivers or something like that so they kind of were aware of that heat pump um, idea already um, yeah, so the next steps, I want to do my detailed uh, thematic analysis to look at the different barriers and opportunities and enablers for mine water geothermal. Um, and then I'm also going to look at the different capacity um, for this, the current capacity that is in these companies. And I'd like to maybe do some more interviews um, to try and get a local authority perspective on this. Um, so that's me done.